Hi there, welcome to Elam Church Online. I'm Terry Lynn, one of the pastors here, and we're so glad that you have decided to join us today. If you're new, please head to our website at elamchurch.ca and click Start Here. We'd love to get to know you. Or if you need prayer or just someone to talk to, wherever you are in your journey, please reach out and one of our pastors will get back to you as soon as possible. Today, we're going to worship together and then hear from Pastor Marvin as he shares about his journey in life and ministry. We hope that you are encouraged and inspired by it. We pray you are encouraged today and don't forget to click share to pass on that encouragement. God who saves, we sing to the God who 
touch the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty place And treasures that fade Are never enough When you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing, nothing.
thank you for joining us uh, again today in this online uh, uh, service. And, and, you know, the message today is perhaps the most unusual message that I've ever preached. And it comes out of a request by a team of people that were appointed by the board of our church here at Elam. As we were moving forward with the leadership transition, there would, of course, be a pastoral search team who would, you know, do their good work on identifying the next lead pastor of Elam, and that has already happened. But alongside of that, the board appointed a team of people who came together to plan for this month, the month of November, to be a month of appreciation for our 34 years of ministry here at Elam. Now, when I heard it would go a month, I kind of inwardly panicked. It seemed like it was too much, too long, and it seemed kind of awkward. You know, church is not about a pastor, and being the object of a month's focus seemed like overkill. But when they came to me with the plan for November, it actually seemed manageable. Their request for this weekend was that I share my story, my journey. And so now with the benefit of hindsight, I've got to say that it's been an amazing journey. Not always easy, not always straightforward, but always an experience of God's leading, God's guidance, God's faithfulness, God's provision, and yeah, God's grace. As, as well, times when God disciplined me and corrected me and convicted me. There's certainly been times of trial and testing and stretching and growing. So where to even begin? And how do you pack 65 years of my life's journey into the next 22 minutes? As I thought and prayed about this opportunity, I identified some things that marked my journey in a significant way. The appreciation team asked that I'd also share the main themes of my preaching over the years, and I'm going to share that actually in a couple of weeks. But for today, I want to share six things that have profoundly marked my journey. The first one has got to be a godly upbringing, a godly home. My parents came to Canada as refugees after World War II. They settled in the city of Edmonton. They met each other. They married. Both of them came from families in the old country that not only had a deep faith in God, my parents had experienced how God had helped them and provided for them and seen them through the very difficult years of war in World War II. And so now, as refugees in a new country, starting with nothing, their lives were difficult. But they made it a priority to be part of a faith community, actually the church where I was raised in Edmonton. And my parents didn't just take us to church. We actually watched them live out their love for Jesus on a daily basis. My dad worked as a laborer, and I remember early every morning before he got on public transit to go to work across town, he would read his Bible, and then he would kneel at his chair in the kitchen to commune with God. The rest of us were usually still asleep. I remember getting up really early one morning, and I remember him see seeing him by himself kneeling at that chair. One of the other childhood memories that I retain is that my mom would, you know, say to us three kids, you know, would you go play by yourselves? And then she would go into her bedroom, close the door, and we could hear her crying out to God, mentioning us by name as she prayed for us and so many others. You know, through their lives, they demonstrated what it was to love God and to love people. I remember sometimes as kids, we, we actually thought they had gone overboard in their commitment to Jesus, but that didn't seem to deter them from passionately pursuing the Lord. I remember how, you know, Saturday mornings, dad was home, and so we had family devotions. And we learned pretty, pretty quickly that if a neighbor's kid came calling while we were having devotions, they would, they would be given one of two options. You can come in and experience family devotions with us, or you can come back later. They all came back later. My parents' commitment to Jesus and their local church so profoundly impacted me. Missing church simply wasn't an option, except if there was serious illness. Even when we traveled on vacation, they would seek out a church if we were traveling over a Sunday. My parents built a small cabin at a Bible camp about an hour outside of Edmonton. It's called Alberta Beach. It was called Alberta Beach Pentecostal Camp. And it was really there that my life was shaped by camp meetings that typically included, you know, at least two or sometimes three services a day for a couple of weeks in July. Then there was kids camp and there was teen camp. And it was at camp that I, I saw older teens and adults in intense times of prayer, kneeling at the altar, crying out to God. And then as a teen, I found myself there in the same place, modeling for younger children what I had been taught. It's there that I experienced miracles and spirit outpourings. And then when I came back home, the spiritual fervor carried into our church's youth group. 
It's there in our youth group that my friendships with other Christian teens deepened and then we endeavored to impact our, our school, our high school for Jesus. And, you know, as I look back now, there were things that likely didn't make much sense. It was pretty strict. There was legalism. There was a lot of lists of don'ts. And it sometimes made faith in Jesus feel too restrictive. But, you know, all of that was formational in my journey. It was at Alberta Beach Camp at the age of five that I said yes to Jesus. I remember the evening service where it happened. I don't remember who preached it. I don't remember what was preached. In fact, it was likely that I was probably asleep on my mom's lap during the preaching. But as people went forward to the altar at the end of the service to pray, I was overcome with a sense that I needed Jesus. And that night, my mom laid me in a prayer to receive Christ. Let me say to you parents, you're not going to get it all right as you do your best to raise your kids. And you know what? There's no guarantee that your kids will take the path you hope they take. But I want you to be encouraged to continue to be faithful to Jesus. Get your teens to youth group and to youth camp. Continue to make it a priority to raise your kids in the ways of God. Continue to model that church and Christian friends are important. I've got to tell you that my journey has profoundly been marked by godly parents. Well, secondly, I think of the call of God. A few months ago, I was uh, in conversation with a couple of friends. Both of them are pastors. Both of them are a little ahead of me in life's journey. One is actually almost 80 years old. And we were talking about the call of God to ministry and what that really meant. And I remember as we were speaking about it, it became very clear that each of us had processed our call to ministry so differently. And that, that's how God works. He works in each of us differently. In fact, you go to the Bible and each Bible character has a different story of God's working. So as I describe my journey, it's my journey and each one has to come to terms with God's call in their own lives. So allow me to clarify what I mean by the call of God. You know, God calls all of us to himself. It's the call to be his child. And then as a child of God, there's God's direction in matters of, you know, who I marry and where I live and what I pursue as my life's work. And this pursuit of one's life work is, is this complex mix of gifts and interests and passions and opportunities. For me, and again, this is my story, it was very clear. Unlike my other pastor friend who said that he'd never had a defining moment where he, where he can pinpoint a call to ministry, God gave me a defining moment, maybe because God knew that I needed that defining moment. Because as a young person growing up, my inclination was actually not to pastoral ministry. I'd been brought up with the idea that, you know, if you can do anything else but pastor, do it. I mean, you need the call of God. If God doesn't call you, then don't try to pastor. Now, I don't, I don't I think it's that clear cut. I don't think it's that black and white. But, but God spoke to me so clearly. And I'll tell you how. My call to ministry is another Alberta Beach Bible camp story. I was 15 years old. It was an evening service. service. The speaker ended his message with a challenge for the young people in the crowd. And he asked us to come to the front of the church, to the altar area, and to commit ourselves to God. And then he asked us to specifically ask God if he was calling us into ministry. And so I went forward and I knelt, but I didn't ask God what he wanted of me. I actually asked God for a sign. I said to God that if he was calling me to ministry, then he should send over one of the older youth to come and talk to me about God's call to ministry, and I actually named the young man that I was asking God to bring over to me to confirm this, and then I waited. I don't think it was five minutes later that Bernie came over, knelt beside me, and asked if God was speaking to me about committing myself to ministry. Well, that seemed like a clear enough sign, and it actually sent me on a path to Bible college and my first pastorate at the age of 20. And it was here that I began this lifelong journey of learning about servant leadership and what it means to be an under-shepherd. And over the ensuing years, God's call took me to Winnipeg for five years and then Calgary for five years and then for the past 34 years right here to Elam. So let me throw out the call that so deeply marked my own life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you to ask God what he would have you do. Ask God if he's calling you to devote your working life to ministry. And if, if he's... If he doesn't respond, if, if, if there's a no, ask him what he wants for your life. Well, thirdly, the things that have marked my life so deeply are mentors and people who believed in me. 
You know, the word mentor doesn't show up in Scripture, but mentoring is a biblical idea. We see so many examples of mentoring relationships in the Bible. I think of Jethro, who mentored his son-in-law, Moses. Moses mentored Joshua. Eli mentored Samuel. Samuel mentored Saul. Then David, king of Israel. David mentored his army commanders, his government officials. And then David mentored his son, Solomon, who became king. Solomon mentored the queen of Sheba, who returned to her people with his wisdom in the form of Proverbs that applied God's laws. I think of the prophet Elijah, who mentored Elisha. And then Elisha mentoring King Jehoash. Daniel mentoring Nebuchadnezzar. Mordecai mentoring Esther. You move to the New Testament and you have Jesus who chooses 12 men to be with him. Those apostles then mentor hundreds of other leaders, including the Apostle Paul, who in turn mentors Timothy and so many others, including a couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla, who then mentor Apollos. And you can see how that, how that works. And you know, as I look back, I identify scores of people who invested in me, who believed in me, who pushed me in all of the right ways to take risks and to push beyond my comfort zone. I think of my Bible college president, who put my name into a church for my pastoral internship one summer. And at that church, I lived with, with one of the pastors and his wife for that summer, and his name was Ken Bombay. And for the next decade, that pastor, Ken Bombay, showed up in my life at critical moments, sometimes to encourage, sometimes to counsel, always to express great care and great faith in me. When my time came to an end at the church I was serving in Calgary, I was contacted by various churches who told me that Pastor Ken Bombay had passed along my name, and now they were calling to see if I would consider candidating at their church. One of those pastors that Ken contacted was Pastor George Johnson in a church known back then as Elam Tabernacle in Saskatoon. It wasn't long after that that I was sitting across a table in a restaurant in Calgary having breakfast with Pastor George, talking about the possibility of moving our little family to Saskatoon. And on a minus 37 morning in January 1990, we were moving into our home on Swan Crescent in Lake Ridge. A few days later, I got lost trying to find my way out of Lake Ridge on my first day at the office at Elam on 8th Street. And then as Pastor Johnson's time, came, uh, time at Elam came to a close, the board went through a pastoral search and asked that, you know, Marvin, would you let your name stand as a candidate for the senior pastor role? They believed in me more than I believed in me. In February 1992, when the membership voted me in as the next pastor of Elam, you know, I experienced that there was a level of faith in me by the congregation that exceeded my faith in me. I had faith in God, but the challenges I was taking on were much bigger than my 33 years of life experience. I remember a board meeting early on where I was asking the board for their wisdom. I was seeking their counsel about a certain direction for the church. And I remember a board member just saying to me, Marvin, we're behind you, you go for it, and we're going to back you, we're going to support you. In 2005, as our church was in the midst of planning for this building, I attended a, a pastor's breakfast put on by the Gideons. And I sat behind, beside a fellow pastor. I'd never met this man. He introduced himself as the new transition pastor for a Baptist church here in Saskatoon. Meeting Dr. Paul Magnus that day was the beginning of a friendship with a man whose leadership and influence has impacted literally thousands across Canada and around the world. And that day, it cemented a relationship, and Dr. Magnus continues to coach and mentor and encourage me. And so my message is simple. Be a mentor. Find a mentor. It's God's gift within the body of Christ. You have no idea the numbers of people that God may want to influence through your life. Mentoring doesn't take special gifts or skills. Only the willingness to engage with someone for the purpose of listening and strengthening and encouraging and spurning them on to living their life, their God-given calling. I'm always delighted to hear the mentoring stories right here in our own, in our own church family. Mentoring has significantly marked my life and as well the scores of people who saw potential in me when I didn't always see it in me. That's been so tremendously impactful. Well, fourthly, it's pressing into God. You know, somewhere early in my journey as a Christian, it was impressed upon me that my relationship with God was the most important thing in life. You know, we're eternal beings. 
We're made in the image of God, and God has put within every human the need to be vitally connected to him. For years, my time alone with God that my parents had modeled was something that I chose to embrace. And honestly, a lot of the time, it's easier to not do it, to just go through the day without this vital connection to God. And what happens is that days can turn into weeks and weeks into years. Well, and you know how that goes. When the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus tells them to go into a room, close the door, shut out the distractions, and close yourself in with God and pray. And I am so grateful that many years ago, God impressed this very thing on me that I needed to spend time alone with him. You know, everyone's different. For me, it meant getting up earlier than I need to in order to spend time alone with God. That's what I find best. It's an opportunity for me to worship, to thank God for who he is as my father. And then I use the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, and I use that as a template for my prayer time. So I begin with worship. Father, hallowed be your name. And I think about all of the wonder of who God is. And then submission. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then petition. Give us today our daily bread. Praying for my own needs and the needs of others. And then for protection, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then I end with worship. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. You know, I realized early on in my pastoral journey how easy it is to get caught up with the work of the Lord and then have no time for the Lord of the work. I also realized early on that pastoral ministry won't be fruitful. In fact, it will become overwhelming. It will become frustrating if I'm not continually drawing on God's presence and the strength that comes from time alone with God. I was in my late teens when the Lord burned into my heart the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you as well. And then the other passage is the words of Jesus in John 15, 5, where Jesus said, I am the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me you can do nothing. Well, fifthly, here's what's marked my life, trusting God for him to do the impossible. You know, pastoring continually pushes you to face your limitations. What do I mean by that? It's these things that I hear constantly. Pastor, I've got cancer. Pastor, I don't know what to do with my child who's out of control. Pastor, my marriage is coming apart. And it's not that people tell me those things with the expectation that I'll make them well or fix their marriage or get their troubled child to come to a better place. Part of their telling me is to unburden their troubled soul. But the other part is that together we can bring it to the one who can heal their bodies and change the hearts of their family members and can pour his peace into troubled hearts. In the early 2000s, as we were looking at moving out of our building on 8th Street and then you know, we were looking at building a new facility, there were so many questions that started with the word how. How are, how are we going to be able to afford 10 acres of service land? And then once we buy the land, how will we be able to raise the money to pay for it? And then you know, how are we going to construct a new building? How are we going to bridge from our 8th Street building to a new building? I mean, we needed to sell our 8th Street property in order to help finance the building of a new facility. How do we bring our church family together in unity around such a huge undertaking and commitment? And then when the prices started coming in for construction, there was the obvious question, how will we ever find our way through these challenges? And I remember sleepless nights. I remember long meetings. I remember conversations that at times were less than encouraging. I remember actually our attendance, our weekend attendance dropping every time we did a capital campaign to raise funds for this building. And one day the Lord spoke to my heart and he asked me a question. The question was this, Marvin, who told you to build the building? And I was reminded of the certainty that God had put it in the hearts, in my own heart, and in the hearts of a couple of men on our board, that God was in this and that God was wanting us to move forward with plans for a new ministry facility. And then the Holy Spirit whispered, whispered into my heart, Marvin, stay focused on the what and trust me for the how. Through prayer and submission to God, get clarity on what God wants you to do. By the way, if your dream is bigger than what you can accomplish on your own, it's pretty likely that this God-sized dream is actually God-inspired. 
And from that day to this, when the question of how starts to dominate or want to dominate my mind, I'm reminded to lean into God, lean into his presence, his purposes, his voice, and trust God to do what only he can do. In the early 2000s, at the beginning of the relocation journey, I could never have imagined the amazing ways that God would come through to answer the how question when it comes to this ministry facility. And here's what I learned. Do what you know God wants you to do and trust him to do what only he can do. Well, finally, something that's marked my life has been lifelong learning. You know, God has put within the human heart and mind a curiosity, a desire to learn and to know and to understand. And as it's, it's as I've leaned into that desire that I've actually seen God work in my life in ways that have produced growth and helped me move forward in God's purposes. Preacher Andy Stanley was once asked to recommend the best book to read for growing as a leader. And he responded by saying something like this. I don't have the exact quote, but something like this. He said, reading books won't result in growth. Growth happens as you do what you've never done. Growth happens when you take on projects and assignments that are bigger than you. It's the idea that learning is about much more than absorbing information by reading books. That's a part of learning. But so much learning and growing takes place when I take on a project that's bigger than I am. When I say yes to serving, even as I don't feel completely comfortable with the opportunity that I've just said yes to. When I look back on the years that I've served in this role, the greatest growth has come when I've taken the greatest steps of faith. When I've responded to the promptings of the Holy Spirit to take on challenges that were way beyond me. When I've stepped out of the predictable, comfortable patterns to do what God wanted me to do. In Revelation chapter 21, we read John's amazing vision of heaven. But there's, there's a little piece in there, and it says that Jesus will wipe away every tear of those who enter heaven. And the question that needs to be asked is, why are there tears in heaven? Why are people coming to heaven with tears? Certainly there are tears of joy, but those usually aren't the tears that need to be wiped away. Could it be that when we see the wonder and the majesty and the glory that awaits us, that the tears could be tears of regret for what we could have done for the one who loved us so much? I don't know the answer exactly, but, but this I know that the plans that God has for us are greater than the plans that we have for ourselves. And the accomplishment of God's agenda is connected to stepping out of the boat onto the waves as Jesus calls us onto them. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for this journey that you've had me on. And Lord, as I've shared this journey, my prayer is that there would be points that would connect with those who've heard my journey. Lord, there's those who maybe are wondering, what, what, what's ahead? What, what do I need to do? What's my life's work? Who am I going to marry? Where, how is this going to go? Lord, I pray that you would just bring confirmation, whether it's in the ways that you did it for me, or Lord, you deal with each of us uniquely because you've created us as unique individuals. But bring clarity, bring assurance. Lord, for those who are facing opportunities and they don't know whether they should take those opportunities, would you speak with clarity to their hearts? For those who, who are asking the question, how? How am I going to do this? How is this ever going to come together? Lord, help them to lean into the God who lets us know what he wants us to do and then who does what only he can do. Thank you, Lord, for these amazing years here at Elam. And I pray, Lord, that as we move into a new season, as, as, as this church embraces a new leader, I pray that, that you would do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think because of your power that's at work in us and among us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us on this, uh, the first week of a very special month for me, for us as a church, and uh, trust, trust that you'll be with us over the next few weeks. And uh, if you'd like to reach out to us, maybe would like some prayer, would like to speak with a pastor, you can go to our website, hit the start here button. You'll find not only resources there, but a way for, for us to connect with you. Thanks again for joining us. God bless you. Have a great week.